Welcome to the Unlocking the Club podcast, where we host honest and direct conversations about journeys of access, personal truth, and reclaiming space. We share our truth so that you can find the key to own your truth, honor your journey, and reclaim your space. Grab your keys, your wallet, your phone, and invite your friends to meet you at the club. Here's your host, Angela Taylor. Hey, everybody. My name is Angela Taylor, your host for Unlocking the Club. And today I want to start out by talking about our relationship with how we feel about being judged or judgment. And this has been something that has been coming up in conversation with clients and friends and family quite a bit recently. And about a week and a half ago uh, for the Super Bowl, hopefully all of you watch the Super Bowl. I'm a big sports fan. And so you certainly know that uh, the Super Bowl is a big deal on my annual calendar. Well, about a week and a half ago during the Super Bowl, I actually was traveling. So I missed most of the Super Bowl and I was heading through security during the halftime performance by Rihanna. And once I got through security, checked my cell phone, I, I had a bunch of text messages from some friends and group chats just talking about how incredible this performance was. So I couldn't wait to get to the gate, get on my computer and just check out the performance uh, and just to look at Twitter and see what people were saying about the performance. And I was amazed that literally 10 minutes later, once I finally was able to settle in at the gate and started to get on Twitter to see what the reaction was, it wasn't necessarily centered around this amazing performance apparently that Rihanna had had at the time, uh, you know, just showing and demonstrating how extensive a uh, number of hits that she's had over the years and how long her absence has been on the music scene, how much we've missed, um, how talented this particular artist was. There were a few of those comments sprinkled in on my Twitter feed, but most of the Twitter feed was centered around um, judgment of how she looked. And it was fascinating to me um, around whether she was pregnant or if she was still carrying a little bit of um, baby weight after she'd had her, her baby about nine or 10 months ago, apparently. And I was just fascinated about that was the discourse. We were missing the excellence that was on display and centered around someone's appearance. And it just had me thinking about from Rihanna's perspective, how did she muster the courage to show up knowing that people were going to be commenting on her appearance? And it has me thinking about what are those moments that pop up for each of us individually where we decide whether to show up or not, whether to say yes or no, when there's a fear of being judged um, that creeps up in the back of our mind. And I don't have a solution for you. It's just something I've been pondering, something that I think conflicts all of us at some point where there is this fear of being judged that may have us decide not to take on a project, may have us not show up for a opportunity, may have us say no to something um, that was offered because we have a fear of failure, perhaps a fear of being judged as not good enough or not looking a certain type of way. And Rihanna, I'm sure knew that there was gonna be some judgment. I'm sure she was aware that there was gonna be commentary about her performance or about how she looked. And my question is, how can we all show up as powerfully as Rihanna did in that performance where she dropped the mic? Something for me to continue to consider for myself and I hope you all consider for yourself. What would be required for you to show up powerfully despite or in light of any external judgment that may happen. Well, that's another topic for us to talk about on Unlocking the Club, uh, and we certainly will dig into it more. Um, but today I am so thrilled to be in conversation uh, with someone who is doing some amazing work. Our special guest on today's episode of Unlocking the Club is Dr. Artika Tyner. Today on Unlocking the Club, I'll be joined by Dr. Artika Tyner, Dr. Tyner is a passionate educator, author, sought after speaker, and civil rights attorney. She's committed to training students to serve as social engineers who create new inroads to justice and freedom. In recognition of her leadership and service, she is the recipient of more than two dozen awards that include Women in Business, American Small Business Champion, 
international educator citizen, and American Bar Association difference makers. Dr. Tyner is an award-winning author of adult and children's books that include the books, Justice Makes a Difference, and The Inclusive Leader, Taking Intentional Action for Justice and Equity. Dr. Tyner has also founded Planting People Growing Justice Leadership Institute, a nonprofit organization committed to promoting literacy and diversity in books. Thanks for tuning in today as we unlock the club with Dr. Artika Tyner. Artika, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. So good to, to be in conversation with you. I look forward to hearing more about this journey that you've been on. It's been several years since we've been in conversation. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. And curious, you know, we just read your bio. Um, incredible. You've done so many amazing things in your community. And what is missing from that bio? What else do we uh, in the audience need to know about Dr. Artika Tyner? I think one of the most important things to know is where are you from? Mm. Oftentimes we ask, how are you? We ask about the Super Bowl or about your favorite sports team. But this question of where are you from? That's the cultural link and the thread that goes from generation to generation. So I am from the Rondo community. That's my hometown here in St. Paul. And what that means for me is both hope and courage. Hope because as my ancestors migrated north, that they had a hope and a dream for me. They hadn't even seen a manifestation of me yet, but they knew that as they would migrate north, it would open up more opportunities for them to create businesses, to purchase their first homes, and to tap into that Black excellence and genius in ways that we could not imagine. And I'm the direct beneficiary of. So when I think about where I'm from, it's both inspiration and responsibility. And that guides my day-to-day -day life. And if you don't know anything about the Rondo community, we are not alone. There are over a thousand documented cases of racial removal that are connected to our infrastructure system in the United States. So although you may look at freeways taking you from this place and that place, for communities of color and African-Americans communities in particular, it also led to trauma and displacement. But we take that pain and those challenges. And we create those embers of hope of restoring the economic hub of our community and making an even greater impact. Well, I appreciate that perspective of where are you from, of kind of reframing that because so often as people of color, when you hear that question, it's said in a way that is debilitating and demeaning and how you just phrased it is extremely powerful. Just listening to you say that has me leaning in and saying like, where are you from, Angela? Like, like I need to dig into that um, and be clear about that. Like, can you talk about that juxtaposition between those two ways that that, that statement lands with an individual? Yes, where are you from can almost seem accusatory depending on who's asking the question. It can lead to that microaggression or micro invalidation that you're not from here by asking that question. But the reason why I start with it, because we can reown words, we can reown purpose. And I take that, where are you from, to come into the space and say, we are here, despite the challenges that we face, despite the roadblocks and the impasses, we are here to tell our story and to write our narrative on our own terms. So I take it even when it comes in the negative side of saying, you do not belong or you're not a part of this team or this culture. And I still redirect it to say that I'm here. My ancestors fought for me to be here. I have the seat at the table. I'm going to own it and I'm going to make a greater impact. So that way, the next time you hear that question, where are you from? You know that the answer is coming from that sense of greatness, a purpose and unwavering determination. All right, Dr. Tyner already dropping dimes here and I'm locking the club early on because literally that is what we are intending to do with Unlocking the Club is reclaiming our power. Is so often there's, whether it's words or phrases or stories that are aimed at being weaponized, right, to harm us or to create the trauma, trauma that you allude to. And we can reclaim our power and own it in a way that is inspiring. So I'll ask you, you talk about the Rondo community, about being about inspiration. What inspires Dr. Artika Tyner? Definitely my foremothers. When I just think about 
what not only did they endure, that's only one piece of the story. What did they create? They created in me a world full of possibilities. Like my mother, oftentimes I'd say, well, I, I want to be like somebody else, or I want to try this, or I, mother would say, be the best original, be yourself. So she was giving me an invitation of a journey of self-discovery to find out all the gifts and talents that God had placed within me to nurture them and help them to unveil, to be a blessing in the world in ways that I didn't anticipate. So who inspires me? My grandmother, my mother, those women that came before me and everyone said they'd have to beat the odds. They took the odds, turned them on their face and created possibilities that no one could dream of. When I think of my grandmother, for instance, my grandma Nellie, she had the voice of an angel, this beautiful soprano who led every choir in the Baptist convention. But one of the things that I always said, well, I want to sing just like you. And she was like, well, what, what if that's not your calling? And I was like, no, 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 just like you. But I found that that sense, just like the community organizers say, got voice, got power. Her power was in singing those gospel hymns. My power is in the courtroom, in the Capitol. In any place that you give me the mic to speak up for justice. So they taught me to use what I was given and understand that I was fearfully and wonderfully made and to use those skills to touch the world in my unique way. So when I go into a space, I already feel fulfilled because I know what type of power, sense of agency that I walk into. And also they encourage me to explore. The greatest gift that they gave me was reading and an invitation to build my own library since I was a little girl. My grandmother used to take me every week to the Salvation Army to buy a book. So I had my allowance. I worked hard, got a couple of dollars and I could buy books. Still yet today, that love of reading opened up my eyes and my heart to a creativity that I never could imagine. So when I think about who inspires me, what comes to mind is a poem from Dr. Maya Angelou when she talks about grandmothers. She makes a declaration that I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. So when I walk into the room, I stand with those four mothers who help to pave a way for me to be in each space that I walk into. Wow. Whew. Preaching today. And I get curious. You mentioned um, that your grandmother, Nellie, said that your power is in the courtroom and you discovered that. Was that always the case? Right. Because you can show up powerfully. You can do all your due diligence and your work and get all of the good degrees. But we also understand that there are systems and structures that want you to think that, but that don't actually actualize that. Yes, I think that's the greatest challenge that we all face. We aspire for things like justice to be an absolute truth of something that maybe we're entitled to if we worked hard enough on the case or if we prepared enough. But we know that Words like justice, words like peace, and even hope requires action and requires a commitment. And it may not be something we achieve today, but we keep working towards it each tomorrow. So when I think about what my grandmother grounded me in was a sense of determination and purpose. And it was also a lesson that I learned from Justice Alan Page. I'm also a Page scholar. And one of the things that I heard him talk about in a speech one day was this idea of you first have to master the rules of the game. And I'm like, of course, he's saying this because he's an athlete. But if you were listening and in tune to what he was really saying is that you learn the rules. His next step was that you master the rules. And then I would add another step. Once you master the rules, you also work and aim towards getting the power to change them. So a part of it is understanding process. What I could change 20 years ago as a young professional may have been my attitude or my peers. We were the young attorneys, the young people emerging out of law school. But today I'm uniquely situated with a different dimension of wisdom, understanding, network, all those pieces. And at this point in my career, I know the rules and I know the discrepancies. But all of a sudden, the tables turned a little bit because I have the power to change them. So as we look at what Alan Page said, so learn the rules, master the rules, and change them. I'd love to dissect each of those steps for our listeners who may be at you know different stages on their own journey. So that first stage where you're learning the rules, who did Artika Tyner need to be? And how did you need to show up to learn the rules? and feel whole and seen and heard and valued? For me personally, 
I had to still be the best original be myself. But in a way of learning some lessons and some willingness to learn, because I had to learn, you know, if we're looking at something, I'm a civil rights attorney. And when I think of the context of that, I primarily work on racial justice and gender issues. I'll use a sports metaphor to set the context of what I'm referring to. When you're thinking about systems and structures that are trying to maintain their power in the status quo, they'll tell you, show up for hockey. That's the game we're playing today. But the realization, and they knew long before they gave you the invitation, that you really had to be prepared for tennis. You get there and realize it's a tennis game and not mm -hmm. hockey. Many young professionals and many folks from what we call quote unquote marginalized populations would get discouraged. I learned how to gain the versatility to be ready for every game that was presented. And what did that mean? Did it take a lot of hard work and dedication? Of course it did. But I knew that the rules depended on who was making the rules and the context. So I had to be ready with enough versatility not to dis get discouraged every time there was a challenge. I think that's a part of where many people struggle. When there's a challenge, you feel like giving up. When there's a challenge, it looks impossible. I had to take challenges and turn them on their face and say, okay, so next time we're ready for hockey and tennis. How? Oh, Girl Scouts honor, we're prepared. <laughs> and you don't know what you're prepared for, but you have to be prepared. Now, within that, some would say, well, that creates additional stress and pressure. Of course it does. Me still being the youngest, the only person of color, the only woman to walk in the doors. Yes, that takes a different level of preparation, but it also helps to yield to those other steps that we're going to talk about. My ability then to transform the rules. That way, the person who comes after me doesn't have to deal with those same challenges. And notice what I'm going to say. They can go further, faster. I'm not like the average mentor, and I'm not looking for the average mentor even for myself. The example that I give people is like David and Saul. David and Saul had the perfect relationship from the onset until something changes. There's a tension where they say Saul slew thousands and David slew tens of thousands. Mm. Saul should have cheered and danced. But if you don't understand mentorship and your role in changing the rules and creating new opportunities, that creates fear. And in this case, in this scenario, it also creates the seeds of distrust and hatred even, per se. Where am I getting at with all this? That you're changing the rules and engaging in the rules so you can celebrate the accomplishments of people coming after you. There are many of things that I challenge that I won't reap the benefits for probably even in my lifetime, but somebody else can come after me and go further faster. And when they do, and they defeat 10,000 giants of racism, 10,000 giants of sexism, I'm going to cheer them on. Yeah. Amen to that. And I get curious too, Artika, is like you hear so many stories, like you're, if you're in a conversation with a strong Black woman, you hear this all the time, right? You hear like maybe 10% of the obstacles or challenges and 90% of the overcoming. Right. It gets back to, you know, in your backyard, Dr. Resma Minikin, who talks about, right, my grandmother's hands. And if you look at her hands, um, you see the strength in those hands and you see like how they were shredded by um, picking cotton. But then you see the resiliency that they heal themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, is typically the story of, of strong women in general, um, but certainly the strong black woman. Uh, and I find it fascinating to hear that sometimes when we are able to exhale and in those moments of vulnerability, and in addition to that 90% strength and resilience and empowerment, we can be vulnerable and share that 10% of the fear, the frustration that that shows up too. So I'm wondering along that journey, particularly in that first space where you're learning like, can you unlock that club of the reality of the situation? In addition to you hearing like the village behind you saying the, you know, the hope and what we're about and the possibility, but also the reality of, of the day-to-day -day navigation. That's the challenge. That's a difficult piece. When you're in it, you don't see a way out. If I told the Artica 20 years ago where I'd be today, she wouldn't believe it. Yeah. She would say that it might be not impossible, but how will you conquer that many giants to get to your destiny? 
And that's why the mentorship piece is vitally important. You need someone to be able to say that where you are today is not where you'll be tomorrow. But you don't need them just to say it. You need them to take the strategic action to ensure it. So I don't think it's always the responsibility of the young professional to go through that process of self-healing and self-discovery. Those are natural things that happen on a career journey. But I do hold myself accountable to be sitting on the other side as a more seasoned professional to be able to tear down those barriers. And let's put it in the business terms, to be able to coach, mentor, and champion others. And not to take it because there have been a lot of mentors on my journey. They would say then, well, you have to go through this so then I can you know, have this journey of learning. I don't necessarily believe that to be true. I don't want someone to go through another set of inequities or challenges to prove themselves. I want them to be able to be whole enough to renew themselves because that's a skill they'll need for the rest of their lives. And they don't have to prove themselves by how many scars they have on them that they were pushed down by that microaggression. They lost this promotion. No, no, no. What I hope to be able to do is to provide that space where someone can be in their fullness and their wholeness, not to say they won't face adversity, but I can help to eliminate some of the unnecessary ones. And my mentees can tell you, Dr. Tyner walks in the room is no nonsense. Why? Because why should they have to go through some of the same unnecessary challenges and barriers that I had to go to? We have to at some point say it's our responsibility to bring forth progress. Yes. So, and you can tell the conviction with which you navigate the, the hallways in which you preside. Um, what's important about exactly what you just said of making sure that you're, you're reaching back and helping someone else out and not making them have to walk uphill both ways in the snow with no shoes on, right? Just because yes. that may have been your journey. I think it's a, a piece of that progress because by alleviating some of that pain and trauma, my hope is going back to that mantra that I teach all my mentees, you're supposed to go further, faster. They can put their attention somewhere else and they can do something that oftentimes, I don't know why it seems so radical, but they can take some time to refresh and renew because that's where the creativity and the innovation unfolds. Mm -hmm. A part of, and Toni Morrison characterizes this best, when we talk about racism, a part of racism is the art of distraction. If I can keep you so distracted from unveiling your full potential, unveiling your full genius, what can you accomplish? So my hope is to be able to provide those spaces where someone is not always met by every distraction, that they can really take time, because time is a finite thing with an infinite impact. So they can take this finite thing called time and refine their skills, refine their tools. In my field, of course, maybe it's learning a new area of law and innovating its delivery using AI. I don't know what it could be, but if you're so busy fighting against every ism, you don't even get the time to create. And that's what I would tell my younger self. I would say withdraw. And I'll talk about this a bit more when I reflect on my experience in higher education, because I thought there was no power in withdrawing and that you're supposed to just constantly fight. This process of leaving higher education was one of the best journeys of my life. And at first I thought, oh, that reflects that you didn't win, that you didn't beat down every barrier, that you didn't fight every racist comment that your boss made towards you, your dean. But then as I reflect on it all, in retreating, I wrote 34 books. In retreating, I was able to build new platforms, social enterprises, help other people strengthen their business ventures. Why is this important? Because going back to Toni Morrison, if I'm always distracted, I don't have the energy to create, to build and transform these systems. So who was it in your estimation that defined your decision to leave higher education as retreating? I had to decide. At first I was bitter and frustrated because it was decided for me. Uh, basically it was a decision that your position's been eliminated. We closed your center. Good luck to you. Now my younger self would have taken that as both a slight an insult and another act of racial harassment and discrimination. My more seasoned self said, pause and think about the whole picture. What has nourished you? The students. Where can you find students? Everywhere. So will you compromise yourself and your well-being because of your love of students 
and miss a greater opportunity to teach all over the world. Was there, as you're ruminating on that, what was the catalyst to you making the decision that like, I could do this anywhere. Like I do have a global classroom. My students themselves, mm. because they notice the dissonance, this uneasiness. And they kept saying, what's next, Dr. Tyner? <laughs> I kept thinking to myself, how do they notice this? Like They're like, what's next? There's something else you're supposed to be doing. What's next, Dr. Tyner? And as they asked what's next, it allowed me to retreat and start thinking, what's next if there's no limits or no boundaries? What's right. next if it hasn't been shaped and defined yet? What's next of a possibility that I haven't even seen? So it was that sense of the first female head of state. President Ellen Johnson Sirley, what did she say? If your dreams aren't big enough to scare you, they're not big enough. So all of a sudden, even my students started to ignite as they asked those questions of what's next. What they were saying is live in your fullness. Even if they didn't fully understand what they were saying, they're speaking to my spirit saying live in your fullness. Discover your own platform. If this platform is not made for you, and it's that simple notion, if love is not being served here, you need a new table. So I made it very clear with leaving the university, I will miss my students, but I won't miss higher education. And I won't miss my institution if you want to be specific because love wasn't being served there. The opportunities were not available in ways that they should have been based upon the color of my skin and my background. We have to acknowledge that. So I would also give people the challenge of how long do you stay in a space where love's not being served? How long do you stay in a space where love's not being served? That is the quintessential question that we need to ask ourselves. Because I find it really fascinating how often, and, and this was true in my own life, how often you hear for, from individuals who pivoted on their journey. That is the quintessential question that we all need to ask ourselves. And Artika, I find it really fascinating that so often, whether it's from my own journey where I'm able to step back, pause and reflect, or in the conversations with other guests that we've had on the podcast, or just in conversation with friends and uh, colleagues. So often when we're on our journey and we're, we come to the place where we need to pivot, oftentimes we look at there's an external factor that is the catalyst for us pivoting. And after that pivot, we get to a better place, a place where we have more clarity of purpose, uh, more passion. Uh, we feel that we found our calling. We've been able to unlock and unleash our superpower. But without that catalyst, without that um, reason why we need to move on, move forward, move away, we may still be in the same situation that we've been in for the last decade or so, where we may be happy or we may be moderately happy, or we may be thinking like the grass isn't always greener, so let me stay where it's safe. Uh, and that's happened for me a number of times um, over the course of my career where there was a reason something happened and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not gonna put up with this, right? Um, but should I just stay? It's comfortable. Right? I'm doing what I want to do. I'm impacting people that I want to impact. I'm working with folks that I enjoy being around. Um, but this, like, right, this interaction, this individual, this circumstance uh, is not in alignment with my values. And once you pivot, you're like, wait a minute, like, why didn't I leave earlier? Why didn't I make that decision sooner? What did you learn about yourself? Because you you've been in higher ed for a long time. What did you learn about yourself in that process? Because it may not have been when you were in the weeds, it may not be necessary as much now, but in the motion that you had in making the decision in that transition, I imagine there's an incredible amount of information that you learned about yourself, not just the system and the structures that we're operating in and abiding by, but about how you have chosen to operate in those systems and structures. I learned about myself a process, learning those rules. Now, I'm not going to say I didn't change anything in higher education, but I am going to say that I had to learn the rules to see some of the systemic challenges that we face, not just in higher education. Fill in the blank, a Fortune 500 company, my friends are there, they face similar challenges. Nonprofit, wherever you are, government. But what you have to learn is something about yourself. 
And I had to learn that zero tolerance related to the values that resonate with me. And when I'm talking about love, I'm not talking about just a sentiment or emotion. I'm talking about the values of the organization. For instance, higher education, our core value is supposed to be what? Serving the public good. Why do you stay at an institution then that's not serving the public good is a question I had to ask myself. Mm -hmm. Our next piece, of course, is about serving our students. You then have to ask yourself, are we then helping to inspire and to motivate our students to challenge themselves and change the world? You start asking questions. So what did I learn about myself? Once again, that you need time for renewal and reflection to pause, reflect and grow to ask some vital questions about yourself. It was more about me than about the institution. The institution is secondary to a process that would allow me to sit somewhere that I don't feel comfortable, I'm not appreciated, doesn't align with my values for that long. That was me. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about me, I now am more determined to take the time to reflect on where I am as more of a daily accountability measure. Where am I? Are you making an impact there? Does it align with your values? What are the outcomes? And then here's the question that we don't like to ask. Is that a good use of your time? Mm. 24 hours in a day. I know Mary J. Blige says we have 25, <laughs> eight, but she was just being aspirational. We have 24, seven. Right. And once you start narrowing that down, 24 hours is not a lot of time. 365 days is not a lot of time. You have to ask yourself, what are you doing with it? Yeah. And why do I say that? Because look at all the healthcare disparities and challenges that black women face alone. Each day is a gift because we still need to fight for our very existence, whether it's maternal health, whether it's related to, to breast cancer that disproportionately impacts us, heart disease, you name it. We still have work to do and we're fighting impediments that try to take away our very existence. So why would we give our time away? So I had to hold myself accountable. It's easy to point the finger at the institution or someone else. I started pointing the finger at myself and started to understand one thing, that I had control over my destiny and I need to start using that control. So Artika, one of the things that's captivating me about the strength that you certainly must have had through this journey, but that is on display today in our conversation is, I just wonder, you know, for high achievers, you always think about, we focus on the next thing, the next action or activity that we can be in. And we very rarely pause and think about how we are actually feeling because that like noticing and being able to name how we are feeling or how we're being in that moment um, is so important to the next step that we're about to take or that next action that we'll make. And so I wonder for you, as you look back at all of those moments, those ups and downs, the ebbs and the flows on your journey, what was it, the feeling that allowed you to get through? Yes, I think the feeling that allowed me to get through every obstacle is having faith, faith mm -hmm. in those things that I, I couldn't see. No one would have thought I'm a first generation college student. That means first generation law student, master student, doctoral student, first everything. So I got to be a trailblazer, not only for myself, but everyone in my family that came after me. In fact, inspired my mother. When I went to law school, she earned her master's degree at 60. Oh, wow. uh, and That's then when cool. I went, to, <laughs> when I was going through each process, you know, finishing up and, and she earned her BA when she was 50 years old. So over a decade, she goes from, you know, first generation. And now we're second generation to bring somebody else under the fold. Why do I bring this up? Because that's the faith that we can endure to inspire somebody else. And then they inspire somebody else. So a ripple effect. And I can't sit there and benchmark myself based upon even what I've seen so far. There are plenty of people that I look up to and serve as a source of inspiration. Powerful Black women like Ursula Burns tearing down barriers mm -hmm. as a powerful Black CEO. The list goes on and on and on. Fannie Lou Hamer organizing and standing up in her political power and in her voice. My list can go on for days and months and years. But one thing that I can say with certainty, the faith to know that my journey, I don't even know if I can express it in words yet. So there was no way that I could limit it or hold myself down or say you haven't accomplished everything yet because just being here 
is an act of resistance. Just being here is determination. So I think it goes back to that sense of for black women, we're always worried about so many other things. Take a moment to just be and just being there's some success there. All the barriers that are against us to just be yeah. and to yeah. just breathe is a very act of resistance. And I own that. So I didn't have to define every step of the way. I know my coaches and everyone gets frustrated with me. You're five, 10 year, 15 year. Let me just be. And the world will unfold and the opportunity will present itself. It'll beckon itself to me. Yeah. To say, you're here and you're ready now. Well, when you exhale and you allow yourself to just be, what is that like? For me, it's a, it's a celebration. I mean, that's what I do my best work. I can hear the voices of my characters, whether it's the children's voice, the young eight-year-old Justice, maybe she's giggling or she what makes her smile. It gives me a chance to hear the creativity, even from, as I talked a lot about my foremothers and the ancestors, it makes me think about from whence I've come. If my great-grandmother Ruth could come from, you know, the what it looked like wasn't possible in Alabama, uh, a life that she feared in many ways. If she could come from that and to make the journey and I'm here and I'm birthed from that lineage, I think the question is, what can I not accomplish? So I don't try to name it anymore because whatever's presented to me, one of the things that transformed my life was going back and traveling to Africa and trying to understand my roots and my heritage. And one of the places where I found myself and my friends would tell you quite well, I never have an agenda. It shocks everyone because they're like, you're so organized. And on a professional <laughs> basis, you account for every minute. I do. But on my personal level, I let the journey guide me. And I ended up in, in Ghana and got an invitation from someone to go out and visit a library. I was like, sure. You know, anytime you say the babies, I'm right there. So I was like, don't even ask. I'll be there with books ready to read whatever you all need. But the highlight was a trip of the trip was meeting our king, hmm. Denahal Koto III. And I'll never forget it. Just the way that he carried himself, how deliberate he was with his words, the vision that he set forth. And the one thing that he also taught us is about our heritage from whence we've come, of the Aquamus being the conquerors of all conquerors. Once you understand that, what do you have to fear? Yeah. But more importantly, understanding all of a sudden it made sense. Purpose, community, and destiny all aligned in that moment when I met him in 2016. It changed my life. So everything that happens to me is an opportunity to learn and grow, of course, but also an opportunity to get me closer to my destiny of making an even greater impact than what I could imagine. Because when I look at our King, every time I go back and see him, I usually go back every six months. He's accomplished more in six months than people accomplish in a lifetime. Yeah. If you are very clear on purpose, on impact and destiny, you're able to do something that most people can't do. You cut out the noise. You cut out the noise of your critics and you even cut out the noise of the critic that's within you called self-doubt. And once I learn how to do that, the rest is just minor details. And it gives me then the energy fueled with purpose to accomplish all that I'm supposed to do. So when you let the journey guide you, which is beautiful and is difficult to do for many of us like that like to control the details, right? Um, <laughs> how do you unlock the club, like, right? And what's your relationship as you look at this journey unfolding for you with you, Dr. Artika Tyner, unlocking a club or many clubs? I unlock the club by walking in purpose. And by doing that, I had to first understand the potential of who I am and what do I bring to the world. I also had to understand where are those areas that I needed to learn and grow? How could I be more effective? I know you're seeing me now, but I'm really an introvert dressed in extrovert's clothing. So <laughs> public speaking and all, and all was not yeah. my thing. Yeah. And so I woke up and understood destiny is tied to this microphone. Put this mic on and get to work. Tell the story of your people. Tell the story of your destiny rewritten from that lesson of the conqueror of all conquerors. The Aquamus, we don't know the story full yet. And that's one of the projects that I hope to work on directly with the king. That the Aquamus, wherever they went in the world, they fought against the institution of slavery. 
they challenged it. And one of their greatest defeats was, and we still have the keys in our King's Museum, is that they overtook one of the slave castles. No one wants you to know that story. The only narrative that they give us is everyone bowed down to slavery and said, this was too bad, too sad. But the Aquamas, wherever they were taken during the transatlantic slave trade, fought for their freedom and everyone else around them. So when you think about that, in order to unlock the club, I had to make space and make room for a learning journey that would even take me to Ghana. I had to make space and room for a journey that would say, it's more important to understand your heritage and spend time doing that than doing the next thing related to law or public policy. You could always do those things. But to understand who you are and what you are supposed to accomplish, that will shape the rest of your life. I had to take time to do that. What I'm learning through these conversations we're having about unlocking the club is I think going into our journey, we think about the, that there is this, this literal and figurative club, like right, that there is a space that we currently um, are aiming towards. And along the journey, as you let the journey guide yourself, it's about that determination and purpose that your grandma Nelly shared with you, right? Um, that's the club. And if each of us as individuals unlock that club of what is our purpose, where is our power, that's the, the best club you can be a part of. That's the most impactful place you can reside, right? That's the most joyful universe in which you can then go back and have an impact and bring somebody behind you. But that's truly un unlocking the club. It's not this C-suite, office suite, right? Uh, it literally is that place where you find purpose and you have the determination um, to do what your calling is. Uh, and I, I appreciate you sharing that with you, that uh, the royalty that is on display and that you heard from reiterated everything that you know and what your ancestors have been telling you all along. It did. And it showed me that no matter where you're situated, maybe that club is in the C-suite for you. Maybe for somebody else, it's in academia. Wherever you are, you just take that key, though, and you own it, and you create change with it, and you use it skillfully. And if that's not the right key to open the door of destiny for you and the people that you care about and the change that you want to do, get the next key. And I yes. wish somebody would have told me exactly. that earlier. Get exactly. the next one and get, get the, the right one. one. Yes, because I think what we thought, like if you think about um, Justice Page, right, and the learn, master, uh, and change is learn and master is about somebody else's club. The change is converting it into the club where you can feel like you're at home and you're yourself, right? Uh, and that is, and hopefully where you find home is beneficial to others who have things in common with you, similar lived experiences, maybe inside of similar identities. Um, but who also can be the beneficiaries for the work and the journey that you've been on, uh, which is incredible. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, so many more things to unpack with Dr. Artika Tyner here on Unlocking the Club, and we will be right back in a moment on the back nine. Welcome back to Unlocking the Club. I'm your host, Angela Taylor. I'm here with the amazing Dr. Artika Tyner. Um, we're talking about being determined. We're talking about finding your purpose. Uh, and we're talking about learning and mastering and changing systems and structures so that you can build your own club. You can unlock your own club. Find the key. Throw away that, that wicked key and find the key that really unlocks your purpose. Uh, Dr. Tyner, here on the back nine, I guess the first thing is, you know, you, you've talked a lot about your journey to Africa, and I'm curious about that. I'm jealous um, about that journey. Um, but beside your own home, what's the place that you feel the safest to actually be yourself? I created it. It's called Aya's Place. I created my own writing studio where we come together with other creatives, other writers, other ri artists, and we help to reimagine the future and create basically the blueprint for it. Mm. Well, and what's safe about Aya Studio? 
I, it's a place where we can come, bring ourselves, bring our ideas, bring our vulnerability, bring our hopes and dreams. And one of the things that I asked the designer to make sure was a part of the overall concept was that it felt like Africa. To me, that feels like home. Exactly. So and the decorum and everything that we've created, we created an essence of home. Mm. When I think about just in observing you and, and having had the, the opportunity over the years to somewhat get to know you, um, there's so much strength that shows up in your presence. Right? And I think that oftentimes we see individuals and they project so much confidence Right. You talked about being an introvert um, that's that's operating in an in a extroverted world um, and you do it quite well. I wonder if there's a situation that you walk into with trepidation every time. Hmm. That's a good question. Maybe my younger self did. I mean, mm -hmm. anything that would require me to get outside of my comfort zone, do that public speech, share my poetry publicly, all those things. But I would say once I made the determination of this idea of being myself 100 percent, it hasn't happened since. Now, this is not to say because then a few of my mentees go, well, you don't get nervous. Ever. Of course I get nervous. But sure. being nervous and confident are two different things. Being yeah. nervous might just be about the experience. It might be sometimes when I'm on a stage and there's 10,000 people looking at me. Yeah, your nerves kick in a little bit. But coming in with the confidence to know that I'm coming in with not myself, but I'm coming for a purpose, it has changed everything night and day because I know why I'm there and I know what my mission is. So showing up 100% you, being authentic, um, what's something that you refuse to hide then? I refuse to hide the fullness of me. So mm. I'm probably one of the only professors that my students met that will do a whole lecture on DMX, Michelangelo, <laughs> <laughs> Picasso, all in yeah. one. Because I can bring the classics, I can bring contemporary culture, I can bring all these things together. And so when I think about that, I taught a whole class on Marvin Gaye, nice. how inner city blues helped us to understand the complexity of race and poverty and intersectionality in ways that students kept thinking to themselves, is this a Motown class or is this a leadership studies class? Maybe it was both. But the reality of it is by coming in and being myself, I'm then able to not have to hide. You can take it or leave it. But the reality of it is if I'm hiding, I can't allow you to take anything from the learning experience. All you're seeing is a representative of me and you haven't seen the fullness of me. Yeah. It, you remind me of this was years ago when Oprah was getting ready to, um, I think, end her show, her daytime show. And, and she was turning 50 and she had um, that special. And she just talked about the power that she found in herself when she turned 50 because it allowed her to not care. Like, right. Be unapologetic about um, how she was showing up because it was going to be 100 percent authentic and didn't have to to try to craft and mold how you show up, which can be again, exhausting to how you think others need you to show up, but you show up fully. And then therefore you have a, a greater opportunity to have an impact on folks um, through that. So I love that that's how you show up in the classroom. And, and I would love to take that Marvin Gaye class. Uh, <laughs> I can imagine that would have been a lot of fun. Um, you talked earlier about, you know, um, you wanting to sing, I believe, um, and um, being told that that's not where your power is. Your power is in the courtroom is what you discovered. What is your superpower? Ooh. Now you're asking the person who loves Justice League, just watch Wakanda forever. <laughs> you're you like, just open us up to another hour together. <laughs> nice. But I'll tell you my superpower is related to two things. My ability to be willing to learn. And even when I'm not certain, even when I don't have the right answers, when I'm supposed to have the right answer, you know, as a professor, you're supposed to have <laughs> certain answers or as a researcher. But to go on that learning journey, I think about Minister Malcolm. Malcolm X talked about he's for truth. And he, he brought forth this dichotomy that truth doesn't belong to one individual. It's a journey that we go on for learning and engagement with love and compassion. So I, I'm telling you really my strengths finder right now is my superpowers. Yeah, uh, so learner, and that leads you to the second piece. Okay. I'm relational. 
uh, my hope is, and I really learned this and it manifested in my life after traveling to South Africa on many occasions, this idea that Archbishop Tutu talked about is a gift from Africa of Ubuntu, that a person is a person through others. So what type of relationships am I creating? How does my very existence help to change and bring us closer to those values of a shared humanity and common destiny? Who am I? What am I bringing to the world to make it a better place than how I found it? So those are superpowers in the sense of bringing together my own Justice League and being very crafty with my technique because I'm always willing to learn more. Well, when you think about uh, what you're bringing to this world uh, and you think about where we currently are in this point in time on our journey and the spaces that you in particular navigate on a regular basis, what's a story that you think needs to be told? The story that needs to be told is we're stronger together than apart. Mm. There's oftentimes this idea that one group has more knowledge than the other, one's better than the other. Yeah. Those are all scarcity models of engagement. I go through a model that's of abundance, that we don't have any competition with each other. We complete each other on this journey called life. That was the impetus for me writing The Inclusive Leader. That book changed my life. It's not to say the other books didn't have an impact in me in some meaningful way, but the inclusive leader forced me to start asking me those questions. What would it look like to create the type of organizations where human cap capital and talent could rise? Not having those circumstances where you were excluded because someone saw the amount of melanin in your skin or they didn't like your accent or they asked that question, where are you from, that I reclaimed earlier. So when I think about this idea of who I am and the inspiration, it was to be able to create change on my own terms. And the inclusive leader gave me the tool to bring others with me on this journey, that we can create the type of world that we want to live in. But we have to be intentional and purposeful, set the agenda for it, measure our impact, and be able to recalibrate when we go wrong and off course. But be on the journey and have enough trust and love and care for each other that we're willing to go with each other to build more effective teams, communities, and families. Well, I, I sense that you are at your best quite often. Uh, and when you're at your best, however you define best, because I think we all have very different definitions of, of good, great, best, better, all those different things. When you're at your best, what is true for you? When I'm at my best, what's true for me is that I'm writing and thinking. What's true to me is based upon my culture and faith tradition. I have an obligation of seven generations from today. That means that I have to make sure that they inherit a better world, whether it's looking at environmental justice, where, whether it's looking at where is our moral compass, whatever it may be. But when I'm at my best, I'm thinking about them. Not today. I'm thinking about how my decisions impact the future and how I can use that for the betterment of society. And once again, I know we're seeing things like the NAP ministry. We're seeing things that encourage rest. Yeah. I'm typically at that place when I'm well rested and when I'm on the banks for some reason of the Atlantic Ocean. So when I'm in Ghana, for some reason, it's like the water and the rhythm of the water and the sound speaks to me. It's almost like the ancestors are saying, keep going. Although mm -hmm. it's not audible, I can feel it. And if I think about everything that I've done in about the past decade and going back and forth to the continent on a routine basis, it's allowed me to be able to write it's allowed me to be able to reimagine and create the type of world that I want those generations to inherit. Well, you mentioned the uh, the NAP ministry. Like that certainly is a club that has been unlocked. Like they had it right in preschool, kindergarten, or whenever, yes. right? You bring some graham crackers and you get a 30 minute nap during the, the course of the day, they have it right. So I love the NAP ministry and what that means and just allowing ourselves the grace to know that you can't go 24 seven or 25 eight, right? As you alluded yes. to earlier, like you need to be able to take a pause over the course of your day, whatever that looks like. If it's just getting up and walking around your office, if it's like going outside and walking around the block, like that is so crucial to us being able to flourish and mm -hmm. um, to be at our best when we need to be at our best. Uh, and so the NAP ministry is one of those clubs that has been unlocked recently. What's a club that um, you would claim as your own? I think hands down, I'd claim Club Ghana. When I think about what has changed my life, mm -hmm. it's been Ghana. To be able to be in the places where I see creatives, whether it's by through the arts in the traditional sense of 
you know, paintings or fashion and design, uh, pr uh, the printing of fabrics, all these pieces coming together on Oxford Street. The food, whether I'm eating wache, fufu, uh, jollof, I'm getting hungry talking about all these things. <laughs> but the club that I unlocked there is my own Wakanda. This place where I can go to, where I see innovation at its best, where I can go to and the standard is black excellence. And where I can go to when I'm working with my king with new ideas, he's like, Doc, let's get started. Sometimes we can't unlock the, the club because we're sitting amongst so much bureaucracy that we can't get one step done. Yes. But having the liberty to be able to create and innovate on how we're delivering education, STEM education in particular, building libraries, medical centers, all these things that take people their whole lifetime to do, to know that there's people that are moving in real time to make an impact because they have a sense of urgency about change has given me a different lens and vantage point of the world that we can change it and we can change it right now. We can change it right now, right? And it doesn't have to be on the boil the ocean, no. right? We don't have to do anything magnificent. We just need to do one thing on a regular basis, right? And step in that direction. And uh, Dr. Artika Tyner is certainly unlocking that club uh, and many clubs through the work that you're doing. I appreciate you so much. Um, thank you for joining us on the show. Where can our listeners or viewers on YouTube find you, Dr. Tyner? And are there any projects that you're working on that we need to, to pay close attention to? Yes, you can find me on my website. It's my name, articatyner.com. You can find out information about my books, resources about the projects that I'm working on. If you're wondering what's currently on the horizon, a few things. First of all, I just launched 100 Black Author Challenge that I also own my own publishing house and bookstore. So it was important to me. We talk about diversity in books. Let's create it. Let's not wait. Let's make sure that we create those mirrors where Black children can see a positive representation of themselves in the pages of books and those windows that Dr. Rudine Bishop talked about. This idea that all children can have the ability to build those cultural bridges. So why wait is often a challenge that I give myself. We decided to take action. So we will train, inspire, and equip 100 new Black authors by 2033. That means that we're holding ourselves accountable to not talk about what we need, not to critique the publishing industry, but to say, what can we do? What's in our hands to make a difference in the world? And then also expanding our Leaders or Readers program. I built that program out of necessity that far too many of the the people that I work with, my clients in prison, learn how to read while in prison. Mm. That's unacceptable. But it's a reality. One in four American children cannot read at grade level by fourth grade. They're four times more likely to drop out of school. And if you drop out of school, you're three and a half times more likely to be arrested during your lifetime. We know one of the ways that we can end mass incarceration. And that's by promoting reading and literacy. So join us. Help support the work buy the books, get engaged, host a book drive, whatever it takes. But let us not only focus on it for ending mass incarceration, but think about the window of possibilities that we will open as each child turns a page of a book. Amazing. I love what you're doing. I look forward to sharing that information with our, with our listeners, supporting your efforts, um, staying in contact with you so that you can let us know how we at Unlocking the Club can help what you're doing. Um, much success. Um, that's such an important mission uh, and um, is basically fulfilling the dream that your family, as they headed up to the Rondo community in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, set out for you. Um, and it's a blessing and it's a beautiful thing to observe. So Dr. Tyner, thank you so much for joining us on Unlocking the Club and sharing your story with us today. Thank you. Honored to be here. Well, that was another amazing episode of Unlocking the Club. Thank you to Dr. Artika Tyner for joining me on the show and sharing your journey and your vision and your mission and passion. Uh, we look forward to hearing more about the amazing and remarkable things that are in store in your future. Uh, for all of you that tuned in today to Unlocking the Club, thank you so much for continuing to support us. Uh, we love sharing these stories of amazing people doing amazing things um, who are willing to share not just what they're doing, but who they've had to be along the way. And one of the things that resonated with me today in the conversation with Dr. Tyner was the thought about letting your journey be your guide. And that requires that we all trust ourselves, 
trust our instincts of knowing when to say when, when to say yes, when to say no, when to move forward, when to pause, uh, when to move on. And so let your journey be your guide. And I hope that your journey brings you back to Unlocking the Club and bringing a friend or two or three to subscribe to our podcast. If you haven't already, make sure you go over to Facebook and join us on our Unlocking the Club Facebook page so you can keep up with any of our upcoming events and activities uh, and programs. Uh, and please spread the, the word with your friends and colleagues who may enjoy learning from these remarkable individuals that we are uh, lucky enough to be in conversation with on a regular basis. Again, for my Unlocking the Club team, we thank you for joining us and look forward to being in the space with you next time here on Unlocking the Club. Until then, be well. Thanks for listening to Unlocking the Club. If this conversation resonated with you, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or your favorite streaming platform so that you can experience every episode. And follow us on social media where you'll hear about future guests, access special features, and connect with this amazing community. Head on over there and let us know how you are unlocking the club. Until next time, peace.